Odin learned of a grand feast in Baldur's honor, a feast that would, tragically, become the herald of his doom. The seeress, her eyes gleaming with foreknowledge, wove a tale of Baldur's impending tragedy, leaving Odin trembling in the face of an inevitable, harrowing fate. Skull Vikings, you're listening to Beyond Asgard, a podcast where we explore the tales of Norse mythology and the lessons behind them. Tune in every week for epic stories of sacrifice, intrigue, and perseverance. For all of our socials, you can visit beyondasgard.net. I'm your host, Eli. Now let's set sail. If you enjoyed this episode and you want to hear more like it, please hit that follow button. Follow me on all socials and stay tuned because I'm going to post one every Friday. Hey guys, welcome to episode two of Beyond Asgard. Today we have a really good one. We're going to be talking about Balder and a little bit of who he was, his death, and kind of the aftermath. In today's story, it's a story written by me. It's a retelling of the original. I'm going to be doing my best to pronounce a lot of these names with the Icelandic pronunciation, which, if you don't know, is very difficult for a native English speaker to do. So Icelandic pronunciation is very different for a lot of sounds, for a lot of letters compared to English. Some of the sounds aren't, aren't just a little bit different. They're just completely foreign to English speakers. They're, they're not sounds that we make really at all in English. So that does make it really difficult. For example, they have, they almost say like a TH instead of a D. So it's like Odin instead of Odin. Then Thor, they roll their R's a lot. So you might hear like, instead of Thor, it'd be Thor. Loki is, I don't know why Loki is different. In modern Icelandic, it's Loki, or I can't even do it right. Loki, Loki. That's really hard. Another example of the rolling R's is Frigg instead of Frigg. Freya would be Freya, almost like a I-A at the end, Freya. One I really have to learn that's going to be really difficult for me is the proper pronunciation for Asgard is actually Ausgardr, Ausgardr, and I... I messed that up. I know that, but I'm doing my best. It really is difficult. If you're from the the U.S. or Canada or generally English speaking country, definitely look up the proper pronunciation. It's very difficult. So I want to learn all the proper pronunciation for the sake of respecting the culture. And also I want to learn more about my heritage. Most of my heritage is Scandinavian. The source of a lot of what we know about Norse mythology comes from two old Icelandic works you got the prose edda and the uh, the poetic edda being that the the stories themselves come from iceland i want to try to use the icelandic pronunciation so today we're going to be learning about balder or baldur baldur it's hard we're going to learn a little bit about who he was we're going to learn how he died and what that kind of represented and what his death brought upon the gods so without further ado here we go Baldur, in the pantheon of deities, stood as a figure of unparalleled adoration, a luminary among gods and mortals alike. Born of the union between Odin, the esteemed chief of the gods, and the benevolent sorceress goddess Frigg, he was not merely a divine entity, but an embodiment of goodness and light. His name resonated across the realms, whispered with reverence and love. His benevolence knew no bounds. He possessed a heart that overflowed with kindness, a soul that embraced the entire cosmos in its warmth. Joy, as if woven into the very fabric of his being, radiated from him like sunlight, casting away the shadows of sorrow wherever he ventured. Every smile he shared, every laughter that graced his lips, had the power to heal the deepest wounds and mend the most shattered spirits. But it wasn't just his kindness that endeared him to the hearts of all who knew him. It was his unparalleled courage that set him apart in the divine tapestry. In the face of adversity, he stood tall and unyielding, a beacon of hope and valor, his courage wasn't merely a trait, it was a force of nature, inspiring gods and mortals alike to face their fears and challenges with unwavering determination. In the grand halls of the gods, his presence brought solace, his laughter echoing like a melodious hymn that resonated through the heavens. Mortals, too, found inspiration in his tales, weaving legends of his magnanimity and bravery that were passed down through generations. There was an aura of magic around him, an aura that transcended the realms of the divine and mundane, making him a figure of awe and reverence. Baldur's existence was a testament to the inherent goodness that could flourish in even the most extraordinary beings. His story is not just a tale of divine lineage, 
but a saga of love, kindness, and unparalleled bravery. A legacy that would be sung by bards and whispered by storytellers for eons to come. His spirit, like an eternal flame, continued to glimmer in the hearts of those who believed in the power of compassion and courage, reminding the world that amidst the gods and mortals, there existed a hero whose essence was etched in the very fabric of existence. Yet, in the grand tapestry of fate, there existed a thread of ominous darkness, threatening to snuff out the brilliance of this celestial being. Night cast ominous shadows upon him, haunting his dreams with premonitions of dark misfortune. Desperation hung heavy in the air, the gods' collective fear giving rise to a desperate plea. They turned to Odin, their chief and patriarch, beseeching him to unravel the enigma that plagued their beloved Valda. Mounted upon his majestic steed, Sleipnir, Odin embarked on a treacherous journey, delving deep into the underworld where ancient seers whispered secrets of what was yet to come. There, amidst the whispers of cryptic prophecies, Odin learned of a grand feast in Baldur's honor, a feast that would, tragically, become the herald of his doom. The seeress, her eyes gleaming with foreknowledge, wove a tale of Baldur's impending tragedy, leaving Odin trembling in the face of an inevitable, harrowing fate. Frigg, a mother desperate to shield her cherished son from the clutches of destiny, embarked on her own quest. She sought pledges from every corner of existence, beseeching all beings, gods, and creatures to spare Baldur from harm. The gods, in a twisted jest that betrayed the gravity of the situation, turned their sport into a mockery. They hurled objects at Baldur, their laughter a fragile facade masking their profound relief as each item bounced off his invincible form, reaffirming their belief in his invulnerability. But in the shadows, where malice festered and treachery slithered, the trickster god Loki saw an opportunity for chaos. He assumed a cunning disguise and approached Frigg, manipulating her love and concern to reveal the one thing untouched by solemn oaths, mistletoe. Seizing upon this unsuspecting revelation, Loki crafted a deadly spear from the innocent plant and placed it into the unwitting hands of blind Hodur. Guided by Loki's malevolence, Hodur hurled the mistletoe, unknowingly directing it at Baldur's heart. A deafening silence descended upon the gods as they quaked with grief and fear. In that moment, they understood that Baldur's fall marked the beginning of the end, the ominous precursor to Ragnarok, the cataclysmic apocalypse destined to consume their world. In the haunting aftermath of Baldur's tragic demise, profound sorrow settled upon the cosmos. It was a sorrow that transcended the boundaries between gods and mortals, casting a melancholic shadow over both realms. As the news of Baldur's death rippled through the vast expanse of existence, a chorus of grief echoed from the towering peaks of the giants to the deepest abyss of the oceans, mourning the loss of a radiant deity whose light had been extinguished too soon. Finally, Frigg gathered herself with an air of grim determination. Her voice echoed through the divine assembly, inquiring if there existed among them souls bold enough, loyal enough, and compassionate enough to venture into the realm of the dead. A silence draped the divine hall. She beseeched for champions to embark on a perilous journey to negotiate with Hel, the formidable death goddess, for the liberation of Baldur. It was then that Hermodr, an enigmatic offspring of Odin, stepped forth, offering himself for this daunting mission. Odin, with the weight of cosmic authority, commanded Sleipnir to bear Hermodr to the underworld, and with that divine decree, the obscure hero set forth on his treacherous quest. A grand funeral was arranged for the fallen Baldur. The ship, Ringkroni, transformed into a majestic pyre befitting a king of unparalleled greatness. Yet, when the gods sought to launch the ship into the sea, an invisible force held it fast in the sand, defying their divine strength. Desperation gripped the heavenly assembly until they summoned the mightiest being in existence, a colossal giantess named Herokin, who arrived on a wolf with reins crafted from venomous snakes. In a dramatic turn, she approached the ship, giving it a colossal shove that shook the very foundations of the land. Harinkorni was freed, and as Baldur's body was placed upon it, tragedy struck. Nana, his grieving wife, succumbed to overwhelming sorrow, her life extinguished on the spot. Her lifeless form joined Baldur. Thor, wielding his mighty hammer, hallowed the flames as Odin contributed his sacred ring Dreipnir to the fiery tribute. Even Baldur's steed was led into the inferno. The air thickened with sorrow as gods, giants, elves, dwarves, Valkyrir, and myriad other beings from the nine worlds mourned, watching the blazing ship vanish over the horizon. Meanwhile, Heramodr, on a harrowing odyssey, traversed nine nights through progressively darker and more foreboding landscapes. He reached the river Kjol, where the giantess Mjodgud, fierce and unyielding, questioned him. And after satisfactory answers, 
she allowed him passage. In hell's desolate realm, Hermodurf encountered the pale and downcast Baudurf seated beside hell's throne. A night passed in the shadowy domain before he pleaded with hell for his brother's release, recounting the profound sorrow that gripped all living things. Hell, in her cryptic judgment, proposed a condition. If everything in the cosmos wept for Baudurf, she would return him. The tidings were carried back to Ausgardurf, and messengers traversed the realms, urging all beings to weep for Baudurf's return. Yet, a giantess named Thok, who was Loki in disguise, did not heed the call. Thok's heart remained cold, callously denying the tears sought by Hell, sealing Baldur's fate. In the chilling embrace of Hell's darkness, dampness, and cold, the radiant light and joyous exuberance of Baldur would never grace the realms of the living again. The gods and all existence lamented the loss of their radiant beacon, knowing Ragnarok was to come. So I really enjoyed that story. I won't dive too deep into my interpretation of the story, but I will say that to me, it feels as though the story kind of symbolizes the fleetingness of perfection, if it even exists at all. Baldur is kind of the epitome of perfection among the Norse gods. He doesn't harm anybody. He never does anything wrong. He's a loving, kind god. But he is the first god to die. The first among the gods in the Norse pantheon. So... Him dying so soon, at least compared to the other gods, can kind of symbolize the the death of perfection or idealism. We see this repeated in many other religions. For example, in Christianity, you have the Garden of Eden, and you have Adam and Eve. Eve, tempted, eats an apple, right? She eats an apple, and all of a sudden, perfection is gone from the earth. It's gone from humanity. I'm not saying that, you know, they're like tied or whatever. All I'm saying is that you see this idea repeated because it, it can symbolize the fleeting existence of perfection and idealism. Because honestly, in our world, neither of those things actually exist. Perfection, I mean, idealism exists to an extent like you can, you can settle and call that idealism, but perfection does not exist. Nothing is perfect. There's always a flaw, no matter how small, even if something seems perfect. Even if something is perfect, it's not. Baldur was set up to die from the beginning. His, his death was prophesized. He was born to live a short life. And as the god of perfection, it just makes sense. Nothing good lasts forever, one, but nothing perfect ever lasts, even if it did exist. Anyway, I really hope you guys enjoyed this one. You let me know what else you guys want to hear, what other stories. You can contact me at host at beyondasgard.net. Be sure to check out all my socials. I'm on TikTok, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook. My podcast is streaming on Spotify Podcasts, on Apple Podcasts. I might even be on Google Podcasts at this point. It's very difficult to get on Google Podcasts. You can look it up if you want. It's, it's terrible. There's no manual way to put yourself on there. You can actually just listen to it on my website, which is a work in progress. You can listen to all of my episodes there. That's beyondasgard.net. Come back every Friday when I release a new episode. And I really look forward to seeing you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.